Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. My name is Blair or the Illuminati and today I'm going over another strange event in history that's interested me for quite a while. And this one is about the Radium Girls. This is most certainly a case of a business putting people in danger, though it's not the story we typically hear on this channel. The radiation poisoning that led to their name, the Radium Girls happened almost 100 years ago in the 1920s, but it's still a topic that's remembered to this day in books and music and one that I I, at least, still find fascinating. So let's dive right in and take a look at how this radiation poisoning happened and how long lasting effects it really had. So let's start by discussing what exactly radium is. Radium is extracted from carnitite ore and is used to create luminescent paints. It can be used in everyday products from wristwatches to toothpaste before its negative health effects were obviously discovered. Polish and French chemists, Marie and Pierre Curie were the first to discover radium in 1898 and learned that by itself, radium in high enough concentrations will glow blue. So the point is, it makes things do the glowy glow. The invention of radioluminescent paint can be attributed to William J. Hammer, who mixed radium with zinc sulfide in 1902 and applied the paint to various items, including watches and clock dials. In a case of bad judgment, he failed to patent the idea. Recognizing a good opportunity, a gemologist at Tiffany & Company by the name of George Kunz did patent it. Kunz and Charles Baskerville, a chemist, made their paint by mixing radium barium carbonate with zinc sulfide in linseed oil. At the time, at least in the US, radioluminescent paint saw little application. It stayed in the bottle. But in Europe, especially in Switzerland, things were different. Quoting Ross Molnar, there were so many radium painters in that country that it was common to recognize them on the street, even on the darkest nights because of the glow around them. Their hair sparkled almost like a halo. In the US, the first company to produce radioluminescent paint was the Radium Luminous Material Corporation in Newark, New Jersey. It was founded in 1914 by Sabine von Sashaki and George Willis, who were both physicians. Their operations expanded tremendously when the United States entered World War I, and in 1917, they moved from Newark to Orange, New Jersey. They also got into the business of mining and producing radium. In 1921, they changed their name to the US Radium Corporation. Radium had only been discovered 13 years before it was even used in paint. And even though it seemed obvious it would be dangerous now, hearing that the radium painters had hair sparkling like a halo, it just didn't clearly worry those in the early 1900s. Radium was new, interesting, and let's be real, some of these watches probably looked like some cool sci-fi futuristic shit back then. The consequences weren't well known. So any safety measures or understanding of radium sort of fell by the wayside in favor of making these new types of paints. The US Radium Corporation employed hundreds of women at their factory in Orange, New Jersey. The paint was marketed for house numbers, pistol sights, light switch plates, and creepily enough, eyes for toy dolls. And I'm sorry, but I don't know who wants a doll with glow in the dark eyes. That sounds like nightmare fuel, but you know, hey, I guess that appealed to people somehow back then. Now, here's where the issue of exposure begins. The US Radium Corporation wasn't fully aware of the dangers of radium, but they figured it would do hardly any harm to the public if there was just a bit on some creepy ass doll. They weren't exactly wrong. It's not as if the entire US got radiation poisoning. A coat of it on a watch, a doll, or on a light switch wasn't enough to start doing serious harm to people, but they kind of forgot about the workers in that equation. Few companies at the time were willing to employ women and the pay was much higher than most alternatives. So the company had little trouble finding employees to occupy the rows and rows of desks. They were required to paint delicate lines with fine tipped brushes, applying the undark, the name of the paint, to the tiny numbers and indicator hands of wristwatches. After a few strokes, a brush tended to lose its shape. So the women's managers encouraged them to use their lips and tongues to keep the tips of the camel hair brushes sharp and clean. The glowing paint was completely flavorless and the supervisors assured them that rosy cheeks would be the only physical side effect to swallowing the radium laced pigment. Cause for concern was further reduced by the fact that radium was being marketed as a medical elixir for treating all manners of ailments. Now, normally this is where I'd say I really can't blame US radium. They didn't know, and this was a horrible tragedy. But here's the thing, the owners and the scientists did start to understand the hazards and they took precautions because they were aware that Undark, the paint, was almost a million times more active than uranium. Apparently they even told people that the 
the medical community was becoming aware of injurious effects of radium. Scientists realized they unleashed a menace, but these women, some as young as 15, according to the New York Times, were painting their fingernails with it, completely oblivious to how dangerous this truly was. If I go and buy a wristwatch, I trust that it's not painted with something fatal. Same with a creepy doll. If someone asks me to handle a paint and doesn't give me a mask or tongs like these scientists were using, then I'd trust it was probably safe to handle. It's really just an issue of how little was disclosed here. This really could have been easily prevented, but selling interesting glow-in-the-dark watches were at the front of US Radium's mind, not the workers' safety. By the 1920s, health problems and even deaths began. It started with fatigue, anemia, and trouble with their teeth. When dentists tried to extract the bad teeth, they were horrified to find jawbones so diseased that chunks of bone came out as well. The extraction sites didn't heal and infections set in. In many cases, the women's bodies were actually radioactive because radium had been absorbed by their bones. Government researchers studied live and dead dial painters and used the data to calculate safe exposure levels for future generations of workers. By 1923, five young women from the orange plant had died from a condition that came to be known as radium jaw. The same thing had begun happening to dial painters in Connecticut and Illinois. As more time passed, some of the women developed bone cancers. What makes radium so dangerous is that it forms chemical bonds in the same way as calcium, and the body can mistake it for calcium and absorb it into the bones. Then it can bombard the cells with radiation at close range, which may cause bone tumors or bone marrow damage that can give rise to anemia or leukemia. How many women were sickened by working with radium is unknown. Medical experts blame bone disease and bone and head cancers on radium, though other tumors like breast cancer that developed later in life were virtually impossible to trace. Of 1,600 women listed in government records as having worked with radium before 1927, 86 had cancers that were probably linked to it. By 1929, 23 other women had died from non-cancerous diseases caused by radium. And this is just by the 20s, within about a 10 year span of the factory opening and it sounds absolutely horrifying. One of the earliest cases was that of Grace Fryer. Grace was a bank teller when her teeth began to loosen and fall out for seemingly no reason. The physician she visited saw not only serious bone decay on her jawbone, but that it was honeycombed with small holes and in random pattern reminiscent of moth-eaten fabric. Three years after these problems began in 1925, her doctor suggested it could be linked to her former job with US Radium. So Grace, looking for answers, decided to have a specialist examine her and asked Frederick Flynn from Columbia University. Also, just as an aside, his name is spelled differently between my sources here, but it's the same story being told and generally the same name. Anyway, strangely, he said she was in perfect health. Her teeth were falling out of her head, but Flynn said she was fine. It turns out that's because Flynn hadn't gone to medical school at all. He acquired a PhD, but wasn't a real doctor. He was working with these companies, including the Waterbury Clock Company to sweep everything under the rug. By the summer of 1926, Frederick Flynn found two cases of radium poisoning at Waterbury Clock. He continued to tell the radium girls they were perfectly healthy. He told Catherine Moore eight times she didn't have a trace of radium in her body. She died from radium poisoning. In 1926, Flynn published an article in a medical journal concluding an industrial hazard does not exist in the painting of luminous dials. Not until 1928 did Frederick Flynn find five girls who might have had radium poisoning. Flynn pretended concern. He convinced the radium girls to accept company settlements that freed it from further liability. With no lawyers representing them, the young, unsophisticated radium girls had no hope of justice. Between 1926 and 1936, Waterbury Clock quietly paid out $90,000 for settlement support and medical costs for 16 radium girls. One family received a paltry $43.75 as compensation for the death of one of their radium girls. Flynn and Waterbury Clock were assholes. It's plain and simple. If US radium realized, holy shit, this is a dangerous substance and took quick action, I don't think I'd be exactly fuming right now. People make mistakes, companies make mistakes. And when they aren't aware of the dangers of radium, I can't expect them to take proper precautions in the first place. But once they learned it wasn't safe and ignored those concerns and even swept deaths under the rug, 
mm -mm, not acceptable anymore. To make things even worse and even more infuriating, US Radium often blamed these mysterious deaths on syphilis and STD to undermine the reputation of these women and absolutely ignored the report of Cecil Drinker. They hired Cecil, a Harvard physiology professor to study the working conditions. And he reported that dust samples collected in the workroom from various locations and from chairs not used by the workers were all luminous in the dark room. Their hair, faces, hands, arms, necks, the dresses, the underclothes, even the corsets of the dial painters were luminous. One of the girls showed luminous spots on her legs and thighs. The back of another was luminous almost to the waist. US Radium dismissed the report, knowing their factory was actually dangerous. It was published later in 1925 when Drinker's colleague, Alice Hamilton, insisted he make his findings public. But imagine how many deaths could have been avoided if people knew sooner. If only US Radium hadn't squashed this report and blamed these women's deaths on an STD. It's absolutely disturbing how many women had to suffer and die and fight to be noticed and heard when years prior, US Radium was perfectly aware what would happen. Grace Fryer and four other women, Edna Hussman, Catherine Schwab, Quinta McDonald, and Albina Laris became the faces of the Radium Girls. It took Grace two years to find a lawyer willing to stand up for them. And even when the lawsuit began, US Radium made every attempt possible to delay the case in the hopes that the plaintiffs would soon be dead. They actually said their own witnesses were going to Europe for the summer on vacation. And that's why they postponed the case for several months, really fucking holding themselves accountable for their actions, aren't they? When in January, 1928, the case finally came to trial, none of the five women were strong enough to raise her arm to take oath and two of the women were bedridden. With the trial marketing worldwide headlines, Marie Curie weighed in stating, I would be only too happy to give any aid that I could, but there is absolutely no means of destroying the substance once it enters the human body. When US Radium convinced the trial judge for yet another delay, famed journalist Walter Lippmann wrote, one of the most damnable travesties of justice that has ever come to our attention. It is an outrage that the company should attempt to keep these women from suing. There is no possible excuse for such a delay. These women are dying. If ever a case called for prompt adjudication, it is the case of five crippled women who are fighting for a few miserable dollars to ease their last days on earth. In an almost unbelievable act of hubris, US Radium's president Clarice Lee stated, we unfortunately gave work to a great many people who were physically unfit to procure employment in other lines of industry. Cripples and persons similarly incapacitated were engaged. What was then considered an act of kindness on our part has since been turned against us and just, the fucking nerve of their president, the absolute nerve claiming that they were already crippled before they began working for them. It goes beyond disrespectful and insulting what US Radium did to these women and the lawsuit, it's just as rage inducing. When they settled, it was for $10,000 plus $600 a year, as long as they continued to suffer from radium poisoning. And yeah, as if some magical cure was just gonna come along and undo the holes in their bones. According to my inflation calculator, by the way, this means the women were given $150,000 by today's rates, then $9,000 a year. 9,000 a year is below the poverty line. And since these women couldn't even raise their hands in the courtroom, it's not as if they could find a job elsewhere. US radium should have been paying them to live out the rest of their lives in luxury after what they'd done to them. Unsurprisingly, all five of the famous radium girls passed away by the 1930s and Marie Curie herself, the one who discovered radium died in 1934. Her decades of exposure left her chronically ill, nearly blind from cataracts and ultimately caused her death from either severe anemia or leukemia. Before the women died, however, two of the radium girls offered themselves up to scientific experiments in the hope to find a cure. After all, for the other radium girls, the two year statute of limitations had run out and approximately 4,000 radium dial painters worked under US radium alone. They weren't the only radium painting business at the time, but without a doubt, they were the worst. The last radium girl, May Keen, died recently on March 1st, 2014 at the age of 107. Apparently her bosses weren't satisfied with her work as a dial painter and she had been quickly fired. So I guess that's one skill that it really pays to not have, at least in those days. The 
The Radium Girl's story, though absolutely heartbreaking, had a lasting impact. It was only after the case of the New Jersey women was legitimized in a courtroom setting, a formal structure for news gathering, did the larger media outlets pick up on the story, accelerating the issue. The out-of-court settlements were discovered and Alice Hamilton, the one who insisted Drinker publish his findings, became an incredible advocate for the Radium Girls. She wrote to Walter Lippmann, the editor of the New York World newspaper, and asked for his help. It was because of her that he said those famous words we mentioned earlier, referring to the case as a damnable travesty of justice. There is no possible excuse for such a delay. These women are dying. If ever a case called for prompt adjudication, it is the case of five crippled women who are fighting for a few miserable dollars to ease their last days on earth. It took so much effort on Alice Hamilton, Grace, and Lippmann's parts to shift this case in favor of the victims. It's actually disgusting how US Radium treated these women throughout the entire process, but just as awful as the lies they told to try and cover it up. Raymond Berry, the young Newark Jersey that took Grace's case on contingency, Alice Hamilton, and the national president of the Consumers League, Florence Kelly, took on the mantle of ensuring this couldn't happen again. Florence Kelly said she was haunted by the cold-blooded murder in industry that took place in the Radium case. She led state chapters on the Consumers League and checking on other Radium dial plants, including those in Pennsylvania and Illinois. In New York City, the medical examiners for New York and New Jersey met with Hamilton, Kelly, and Barry. The group agreed on a strategy for proposing new General Conference on Radium Factory Safety Standards to General Surgeon Hugh Cummings of the US Public Health Service. The medical examiners signed a letter proposing the conference and the New York World supported it editorially. Kelly and her colleague, Josephine Goldmark, visited Lippmann and Goldmark wrote this account of the meeting. The day we visited him in his small office high up in the dome of the old world building was not wholly propitious for detailing our plans. The political campaign of 1928 was in full swing and just at that moment when we reached his office, Mr. Lippmann, as I recollect, was receiving the first wires from the Democratic National Convention in Chicago. He listened to us with great interest nevertheless and promised his full aid as soon as the letter to the Surgeon General had been sent. But he counseled delay, as Kelly put it. Lippmann agreed to help us in every way possible, but warned us that we should injure our case if we attempted to present it publicly before July 4th after the close of the second presidential convention. Endorsements followed even from Mrs. Franklin D. Roosevelt and the Surgeon General. Soon, other public health officials began stepping forward, all because Alice Hamilton insisted her colleague publish his findings. Grace's lawyer didn't give up on the case after it was over and Lippmann wanted to spread the word. These people ensured that the Radium Girls had their stories told and conditions were changed. In 1938, the Food and Drug Cosmetic Act outlawed deceptive packaging that made Radithor and other radium-based products marketable. Bye-bye, radium brand Creamy Butter. Bye-bye, radioactive jock strap. Thanks for making deceptive packaging illegal. The law also banned a cosmetic called Lash Lure that was known to make women go blind. And Karemlu, a depilatory that contained chemicals known in rat poison that left countless paralyzed. Though those last two weren't radium related, just an interesting ripple effect. Radium was still used on clock and watch dials until the 60s, but it was with safer techniques. Eventually, by 1968, it was phased out, and though radium is still in some products we use today, the amounts are not harmful and it's not deliberate. Now, almost everything we know about radiation inside the human body, we owe thanks to the radium girls. They help shape our laws as well as scientific understanding. Although their deaths are a horrible tragedy, at least they were not completely in vain. The story of the Radium Girls is alive and well in the media. Kate Moore was interviewed by the New York Times just a few years back in 2017 because she published a book about her story. She'd heard of a play called These Shining Lives back in 2015, written by Melanie Marnick, and said she felt a sense of responsibility to pass on this piece of history. What Kate said was the most surprising thing she'd learned while researching their story was the company files, their memos, and how deep the corruption ran. They knew what was happening, she said, and they were killing these girls, not only the ones they had already killed, but the ones who were still working. The surprising thing was during my research, I went to the LaSalle County Historical Museum in Illinois, which had a terrific collection of the Radium Girls letters. I'm leafing through this file in the back of this tiny museum, and I not only find letters between the girls, but also one of the most moving things. Pearl Payne, who was clearly a very intelligent woman, though she had to leave school when she was 13 and written for posterity, really, what happened to her, detailing fully about her medical condition. 
conditions. She had problems with her wounds, so she bled a lot. She talked about bleeding for 87 days straight and doctors didn't know what was wrong with her. I was sitting there with tears streaming down my cheeks, reading it aloud. I don't know if it was surprising, but it was just heartbreaking and special to discover this treasure trove of material and to know I could use it to bring these girls to life. There's many other books about this as well, from Historia Claudia Clark to Michael A. Martone. Even Kurt Vonnegut made a reference to the Radium Girls in his 1979 novel, Jailbird, and there's also a movie that's set to be released this past April, although it's obviously been delayed because of the pandemic, so when it comes out, I definitely wanna see it. But seriously though, it's incredible the influence that this story has had on our lives without some of us even knowing about it, and this piece of history has always fascinated me. It is an absolute tragedy what happened to the Radium Girls, and I hope their story can continue to live on for years to come. So with all of that being said, that's where I'm gonna end today's video. If you guys enjoyed it, hit that like button. If you guys are new to the channel, make sure to hit that subscribe button. And if you guys want more content from me, you can pop open my description box. You're gonna find all of my sources for today's video, as well as links for all of my social media and other channels and projects that I'm involved in. Thank you so much for making it to another video. I do love you guys, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.